Hello, everyone. So excited to welcome Ashley James. She is a certified health coach and also master practitioner NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming. And, um, and she also has her own podcast called Learn True Health. Hi, Ashley. Welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here today. Yes, thank you for joining. I, I understand that you have had um, your own journey and experience, and maybe you could tell um, all of us a little bit about your experience and what led you to finding these solutions for anxiety, what you do and you teach others Absolutely. to manage their anxiety. I'd love to. This is, this is one of my biggest passions. I didn't know when I was a kid that I had anxiety. Um, looking back on it now, I if I was a kid nowadays, I'd be put on medication. It's, it was pretty obvious now looking back that I had constant anxiety. I couldn't do sleepovers. Um, I tried and I would just um, go into panic attacks and my parents would have to come pick me up. Um, I would fail tests and not because I wasn't smart. I was, I was, I'm really, I am very bright. I'm very smart, but I had such anxiety that I would uh, freeze. I would just, I, my, I would, I would throw up. I'd have knots in my stomach. Um, I couldn't do presentations. Um, I just noticed looking back and even looking at pictures of my childhood, I could see the evidence that I had anxiety. But back then, I don't know, in the 80s, they didn't, they didn't put kids on meds or, you know, they were just like, oh, you're a kid, go play outside and come home when it's dinner time. Mm -hmm. And they so it really was talk a, about it at all. There wasn't right. Really it wasn't a, <laughs> it wasn't a thing. It wasn't a thing. It's kind of a blessing and a curse because at least I wasn't put into a psychiatric system. Um, and put on meds, uh, because th although um, I would rather see someone on a medication than um, end their life. So, you know, there's times when those medications are super beneficial. Mm -hmm. It doesn't get to the root cause. It's, it's m medicating something that is emotional, that the work is emotional, is not going to balance something. If it's, if, it, you know, so... So what do you do then in that case? It's right. What, back then, um, parents didn't really have those emotional tools. That well, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't get the emotional tools. So um, when I was 16 years old, a friend of my parents turned them on to Landmark Education, which was a personal growth and development program. And so mm -hmm. I took all their classes, and I started to get really excited about personal growth. I read personal growth books. I was I was into it. I was really into it when the internet started taking off. I was listening to, even before podcasts, I was listening to whatever I could get a hold of in, or whatever I could read about personal growth. So I got really excited about it. Um, when my mom passed away from cancer when I was 22, I wanted to make sure I was grieving healthfully because I was really into personal growth. So I went to therapists and what I found was there wasn't a therapist I could find that was um, focusing on uh, excellence that was focusing on optimal mental health. It was either you're sick or broken or you're, there's something wrong with you, you're abnormal or you're normal. And if you're normal, okay, you don't need to come anymore. Like it just, I couldn't find at that stage in therapy, I couldn't find a therapist that was wanting to help people to just become the most healthiest person, to give them life tools. Mm -hmm. And that's where I found neurolinguistic programming. I, that was a uh, landmark education. Most of their tools are from NLP, from neurolinguistic programming. And okay. NLP uh, was created, started in the 60s and the 70s. It's a series of tools that were compiled by different therapists, uh, different therapists that, like Dr. Milton Erickson and Virginia Satir, who were getting excellent results and were focusing on not just you're either abnormal or normal, but helping everyone to be the best version of themselves. Mm -hmm. So mindset is a big is a big part of that, your belief system and how you create the internal representation of your world. Because what you see, what you perceive, and what I perceive are two very different things. We could both go to the same movie and come away with a very different experience. This is why we can have friends that are conservatives and friends that are liberals and go, how could you possibly think that way or see that, see the world in this through this lens? 
And it's because we have the belief systems and a value set uh, and, and memories, uh, all that create the filters that go into making our reality. So everyone's reality is different. So NLP helps us to clean up the unconscious programming that goes into creating our reality. So when it, it gets to the root cause of anxiety and you turn off the anxiety response in the brain. Amazing. Should we uh, look at that now? Sure. Learn that tool now? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. All right. The best way for us to do it is for me to guide you through it. So do you have something that when you think about it right now, you can feel anxiety? Is there something coming up specifically in your future that you feel anxiety right now about? Yes. I can tell you things that cause me anxiety. Um, is so there something coming up in my future right now? A specific event? That's coming up in my future? Yes. Not For the purposes of learning this technique, in the future. Um, and it can be something small. It doesn't have to be like a, you know, it could be like you, you are thinking about paying a bill or you're thinking about going to the grocery store or you're thinking about flying on an airplane in the next few months. Like, do you have some okay. event? I do have something. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm also thinking about doing um, by location and I would need to relocate actually to the Pacific Northwest area. Hey, so that's that, my that neck of the woods. Up. Yes. Nice. So that does bring up um, some anxiety for me is just the whole prospect of um, the move and finding a place. So that, that for sure would be a future event. Great. So when you think about moving to the Pacific Northwest, on a scale of one to 10, how much anxiety are you feeling in your body right now? Well, right now I would say it's a four or five. Great. That's fine. So everyone watching, what I want you to do, and it doesn't have to be the biggest thing in the world, right? I just want you to pick something that's like specifically happening in your future soon. So it could be a dental appointment next week. It could be exam you're writing. It could be paying your taxes by April 15th or whatever it is. Something that when you think about it right now, um, you feel anxiety in your body right now. And it could be a two, it could be a four. It doesn't have to be a 10 out of 10. Um, it can be, but just pick something, something so that I can teach you the step-by-step -step process. So then you can do this technique with other events as well. So um, because you, so you don't have a specific date in mind or do you, do you have like well, a- We're looking at next spring and summer to- for, for okay. me to make a potential move. So that would be the timeline. Got it, okay. So I'm gonna teach you the technique and um, if you could, could you pick it just for the purpose of learning this technique, could you pick a date that it would be sure. the, you're the moving date? Let's just say March, 2020. You'd be moving like March. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I would say it's, it's gonna be somewhere in the spring. So it would be, uh, any oh, okay. From April 1st. Okay. Let's say April so 1st. Okay. Just pick, yeah, it was just, just for the, just for the purposes of learning the technique, it's really good to have a specific date in mind. And then I'll talk about more generalized anxiety. So, okay. but, so everyone obviously don't be driving the car, <laughs> although if you're watching, you're probably not driving, but, um, just make sure you're in a, a safe place where you can close your eyes and focus on this technique. So what I want you to, to do is go ahead and close your eyes. And I'd like you to imagine that your entire life is a timeline, like a highway, and you're floating above it. So your past is in one direction and your future is in the other. Maybe it's in front of you. Maybe your future is in front of you. Maybe it's to the side. Wherever it is, is totally fine. And I want you to go ahead and float up. So you're actively choosing to imagine yourself floating up above your timeline. And I'd like you to float 15 minutes past the successful completion of the event for which you have anxiety around. Look down at yourself. You're not looking through your own eyes, you're looking down at yourself and you're seeing what you're doing 15 minutes after the successful completion of the event. Now, keeping your eyes closed, I wanna ask you, on a scale of one to 10, where's the anxiety? Zero. Great. So for those who are now zero, you can come back to now and open your eyes. There are still some of you, it's about 5% of you, 
that still have anxiety. This is good. And you may notice that the anxiety is less and you may notice um, that it's the same. Either way, totally fine. So here's the thing. For those who still have anxiety, there's a few things you have to, you have to, you want to learn, you want to focus on. Some people don't focus on the successful completion. They just focus on the completion. And so what they're seeing is like these worst case scenarios happening. So the, the brain is still creating anxiety. So if you are one of those people, um, imagine, make it up. This is made up. This is, this is, we're just making up a future in which it turned out it, it successfully. So imagine the successful completion, but you're not actually imagining the event, the event completing, you're imagining 15 minutes after. So if it was an exam, you'd be like driving home and calling your best friend or your husband or your mom and telling them about how great it was. Um, you know, if it was paying your taxes, you'd be like, I don't know, celebrating or whatever, whatever it, it, you would be doing 15 minutes later, basically. Um, so in your case, you were sitting around your new home and all the, everything was unpacked and you were yes. like, this is amazing. I love it. Okay. So that's step one. So those who still had anxiety, make sure that you were focusing on 15 minutes after the successful completion. Mm -hmm. If your anxiety is now just checking with your body, looking down at that event, if you notice, if you don't have any anxiety, come back to now and open your eyes. If you still have anxiety, there's layers to it. For you in this, in this particular event, there are layers. And what you need to do now is ask yourself, what am I anxious of now? You'll find that the answer comes to you. Um, I interviewed a, an author who had published his first book. He had anxiety about publishing a second book. So I said, go 15 minutes after the successful completion of your book launch. And I could tell in his face that it wasn't all gone. And he went from like a six to a two. Mm -hmm. And I, I said, okay, what are you anxious of now? And he had this epiphany. He goes, the reviews. And I said, great, go 15 minutes past the successful completion of all the reviews which could be like in 2000 years from now, because it's like Amazon. And you could just watch as the tension melted away from his body. And he really got that he was so worried about what other people thought of him, that he was making up these stories in his head of people hating him. You know, mm -hmm. we do this, we imagine people not liking us. And it's, it's not true. It's, I mean, none of it's made. And it's like these people, we will never meet them. And he probably just has a bunch of adoring fans, but this is what our brain does. Our brain looks for threats and it makes up threats because that's how we survive for however long we've been here as a species. The mm -hmm. optimists didn't survive. It was the, pe all, all of our ancestors <laughs> were the pessimists. So we have this like really working for us. So mm -hmm. for those who still have their eyes closed, I want you to ask yourself, what am I anxious of now? And you may find that there's two or three layers each time go to looking at 15 minutes after the successful completion. Now there's about 1% of people that still have anxiety because I've done this with groups of over hundred people at a time. And mm -hmm. it's really fun because they'll say who, who has anxiety and, and um, you know, 95% of them put up people in the room, put up their hand. And by the time we do the first round, everyone except for like between one and five people um, will have their hand down and then um, there'll be like one person with their hand still up who's kind of gone through and done this a few times. Mm -hmm. And that's because their unconscious mind is perceiving threats constantly. And so what we do is I say, so for those who still have anxiety in the moment right now are still feeling it in their body, what I want you to do with your eyes closed, I want you to float 15 minutes past the successful completion of your life. So what would the successful completion wow. of your life look like? You're 120 years old. You're surrounded by three generations of your family and everyone loves you. You have completed everything in your bucket list. Um, you die so happy, so peacefully, and everyone around you is rejoicing because of the contributions you've made in the world and how much they um, really appreciated your presence in, in their lives. Mm -hmm. And you're looking 15 minutes after, so you float 15 minutes after the successful completion of your life. Maybe you're meeting God. Maybe you're enveloped in white light. 
what does the successful completion of your life look like? At this point, anxiety disappears. There are no more threats left. Threats, they're gone. We're no longer alive. We're in our, we're in our, you know, we're, we're in our energetic body. We're, you know, so um, this is, this is where we come to, why does this work? So this technique works all the time, 100% of the time, because we are turning off the stress response. We're turning off the threat, the constant threats that our brain is sending to our body, these constant thoughts. Um, and it can, we think we're being pragmatic by planning, like, okay, I got to pay the bills and pick up the kids and I don't want to be late. Oh, I'm going to hit traffic. And oh my gosh, I'm not going to be able to make it to the dry cleaners. And uh, we're not going to be able to pay the mortgage payment if I have to pay for this hospital bill. And, you know, we're constantly trying to basically just survive in this world. But mm -hmm. what, what's happening is we're imagining, what we don't realize is we're imagining these worst case scenarios. So you're driving to work and you see a bunch of brake lights in front of you and all of a sudden you have anxiety. That's how quick it happens. And you don't know why. Well, what your brain just did in half a second is it went, oh my gosh, I'm going to be late for work. My boss is going to fire me. I'm not going to be able to pay the rent and I'm going to be homeless and then I'm going to be dead. That's how quick, that's where our mind goes. And that's what we're imagining. We're imagining these, these very threatening situations. Our body is constantly listening to our thoughts as if they're happening right now. Mm -hmm. Like if we were to... Um, go watch a zombie movie together, you know, in a very safe place. Let's get, you're coming over to my place. Uh, I live out on five acres in a rural area, half an hour outside of Seattle. It's so beautiful. It's such a peaceful neighborhood and we're very, very safe. But if I turn on a zombie movie, your, your stress level and my stress level in our bodies is going to be through the roof or mm -hmm. our hearts are going to be racing like they could measure our cortisol levels and see that we're in a state of, you know, panic and stress. That's because even though we know consciously that it's fake, it's just a TV show or just a movie, it's, it's not real. Mm -hmm. But to our, our body is seeing it as though it's real right now. And that's the same for when you're imagining those worst case scenarios with moving to the Pacific Northwest, your body is perceiving it as though those things are happening to you right now. And your body goes, I need to help us survive the bear or survive the tiger or whatever threat that our ancient DNA has, has survived. I need to survive this threat because, you know, a hundred thousand years ago, the only thing we had to do was fight or run away or we run away from the bear or fight right fight fight yeah. flight or freeze to survive yeah. and we had to choose which which one do we have those are those are only three choices fight flight or well, freeze i think what came up for me too in that exercise was the uncertainty you know it was like there was it was just sort of this thing that i have to do and you brought the attention to successful completion so you it, brought it, a positive it, image a positive vision and a place where I could anchor my energy. Right, and you're telling, you, what you're doing is by imagining what you want, you're telling your body that there's no threat. So your body is, is just always listening, your autonomic nervous system mm -hmm. is listening for, do, do I need to hit the button now? Do I need to, it's like a four-year-old, your brain going, can I hit the button? Do I need to hit the button? Do I, you know, do I need to hit the button to survive? And by having uncertainty that, that your, your brain's going, where am I going to live? What am I going to do? What if this happens? What if that happens? Like, like, what if I'm stuck in this situation? And what if I don't like it? And, and what yeah, if I like run out of money? And open black hole right. <laughs> of but just the, ambiguity in a sense. Right. But the ambiguity was, uh, I bet if you slowed down your thoughts, you would find that you were actually thinking of really bad scenarios, really worst case scenarios. Um, so I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about worst case per se. It was just, um, for me, it was like all the energy going into moving is like kind of hard. Okay. So, <laughs> so, so, um, you're, you were imagining being exhausted. Yes. Yeah. And what happens when you're exhausted? Do you end up getting sick? Does your immune system get run down? And then you I think, think I do, I get tired. I don't usually get oh. sick, but it so was you go. So you're, you know, when you're kind of like in that hurried energy of trying to, you know, figure stuff out and get it together and just all that responsibility was weighing on me. So your brain went, I'm going to be tired. I'm not going to be able to focus. 
uh, I won't have energy to work. I won't make enough money because I, I, because I don't have t enough energy. Um, and I'm going to end up not being able to pay the bills. And like, this is where the brain goes. It's worried. Like if I, if I don't have enough energy, then this, 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 this will happen. And, and yes, it kind of stops at the, I don't have enough energy, but yes, I could see how it could spiral. You know what I mean? To, to more negative thoughts. Right. It was just more the ambiguity of it. Yeah. Yeah. So we often don't, we're often not aware of all of, we have an unconscious belief system. So you, if you examine, if you look at and examine your belief system around um, your fear for a lack of a better term, but fears of being tired. You may find that you have a belief system that tired equals this, like tired oh. equals being unsuccessful in life or tired equals being alone because then you aren't like with your friends or, you know, like if you examine your belief system, you may find that see being tired is like, okay, so then I rest and I'm better. But for you, it was creating anxiety. So there's a threat. It has a threat. So there's a belief system around that tired equals X, Y, Z. And it might be because you observed one of your relatives, one of like your parent or aunt or uncle, uh, be tired and then bad things happen to them. Mm. So you, as a child, create a belief system. Like if someone's tired, then they will lose their relation, their marriage, or they will not yeah. be a good parent you know, yeah, or they'll right. get sick. Because my mom would work so hard until she was exhausted and then she got sick. Yeah. So, so you, that's you, what I witnessed. You probably have a, um, now was it, was she able to recover from that illness or was it? She recovered, but good. she, she okay. wasn't able to go back to work. Yeah. So like here, that. so here's the thing. You have a belief system that being tired equals not being able to work, not be able to pay the bills and being sick. Mm -hmm. And you don't know it consciously because you're not thinking about these things consciously. But you right. think, oh my gosh, it's going to make me tired. And then all of a sudden the anxiety and the fear just like is overwhelming. And you're like this fear. Okay. This is this level of threat. Like it's that the, the threat of being tired. Cause you know, okay, we're tired in life, but then we like rest and we're better. But your body is having this much of a response or your, yes. your mind and your body connection is having this much response for that little of a problem. Do, do you know what I mean? So we have to look okay. at why am I having this much of a response for this little of a problem? And it's usually because they're at the unconscious level. There's a belief system that we can examine and start to go, I see now, right? Um, but what triggers, the, what triggers the anxiety is focusing on what we don't want to have happen. This anxiety is not an emotion like any other emotion. This is actually good news. We think anxiety is like anger, sadness, fear, hurt, and guilt. It's not. You cannot feel anxiety about the past. Think about that. You could recreate the most happiest memory of your life and feel the joy inside you. Or you could re recreate a really sad memory or really angry memory. You could think back to a time when you had a fight and still, and it, if it's not resolved, you can still feel the emotion right now. Mm -hmm but you cannot recreate anxiety about the past because it's not an emotion like all the others. It's a warning light on your internal dashboard saying, hey, we're focusing on what we don't want to have happen and there's a lot of threats. Are we really under threat or is this, you know, is this in our mind or is this, are we actually under threat? Because the body doesn't, can't tell the difference between what's imagined and what's real or mm -hmm. what's an imagined a made up future event or, or belief system that we're worried is going to come about mm -hmm. or an actual threat that's really happening right now. Like, like we're driving and all of a sudden there's a boulder in the road and we need to get around it. We want to go into stress response there. We want our reflexes to be able to merge safely into the other lane and get around that boulder without hitting it right? Yes, so anxiety is really serving. That's where it's serving us. But you know, in the moment, we're not really feeling anxiety. We're just, we're just in that stress response that we want to be. Um, mm -hmm. If you're all of a sudden have to run away from a threat or fight a threat in the moment, we want like there's a fire or something, you know, we want the stress response. Um, um, address anxiety in relationships. 
And when people, because this is often a point um, for people is when they're in relationships and their anxiety gets triggered in relationship. Well, that, I mean, that, that there's so many different, um, there's so many different situations though. Is it that they're just sitting around with their partner who's loving and supportive and then they're just in an anxiety response because they're thinking about a, th a stressor or threat? Or is it that they're with a partner that is, that they are having anxiety because of the relationship? I'm, I mean, if you could get yeah, more specific with your question. I think when you get triggered um, in any kind of relationship and, and you have anxiety because, um, you know, social anxiety, or you could be in partnership and your anxiety is getting triggered by your partner. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and how to move through anxiety in the context of relationship? Yeah. So I'm, I would say to look at what, where your thoughts are you focusing on? Are you imagining worst case scenarios? Are you imagining threats? Are you imagining things you don't want to have happen? Mm -hmm. When I was, I've never told anyone this, but when I was 15, I had who I thought was the love of my life. Cause when you're dating a guy, when you're 15, they are the love of your life. And I gave him a ring. I mean, we were giving, exchanging like jewelry as gifts. I think I gave him like um, a necklace, like a guy necklace. And then he gave me something and then I gave him a ring and, um, and we, we had been dating for like six months and everything was fine. There was a little tension because his parents were going through a divorce, but it's nothing about nothing to do with us. And we were sitting on the steps of his school and he begins to take off his ring. And I had a complete meltdown and couldn't, I couldn't stop crying for an hour. Cause I, I assumed he was breaking up with me and it turned out he was just fidgeting with his ring. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, my thoughts went very quickly. He, you know, here he is like he's doing or whatever finger it was on, you know, he's like, he's doing this. And, and in my mind, I went, he's breaking up with me. I'm heartbroken. You know, I, I'm losing the love of my life. And that's where my thoughts went. And then I was in complete, I was in a complete meltdown, like panic mode, meltdown, uncontrollable crying for over an hour. And and th that's what we do is are, are we look for, unfortunately, especially for someone who has anxiety for a long time, we have wired our brain to look for threats and look for worst case scenarios and look for the other shooter drop. Um, mm -hmm. Anytime we do that, even if it's planning. So, I'll, you know, you're moving to the Pacific Northwest. So I'll give you an example. Um, that's commonly here is uh, they keep saying that there's going to be a big earthquake. You know, we're on a big fault any day now we're gonna have a big earthquake. Well, there's a difference between planning and lamenting. So planning is you, you research it, you buy all the, the supplies you need, and then you're done. You create a family plan and that's it. There's, n there's no need to have daily anxiety about the potential of a earthquake, but people do because they're not planning, they're lamenting, but they feel as though they have to think about all the worst case scenarios, all the worst things that could happen and then make a plan in their minds for how to survive that. So it's almost like a form of protection in that respect. Right, it's, they think, think they're protecting worrying, themselves. I think that um, you know, going over it again and again and worrying about it is, is actually protecting and it's serving yeah. something, but it's actually- yeah away at our energy and our vitality yes, um, yes. It's, I, what it's, it's doing is putting us right into stress response right, the second right. we think about a threat even if it's to plan right we're putting ourselves in a state of stress and when we do that um, our body sh switches from the parasympathetic nervous system response to the sympathetic nervous system response of fight or flight our body shunts blood away from our logic centers of our brain. So now we can't think clearly. Mm -hmm. So now we lose the ability to actually think clearly. So once we put ourselves in a state of stress and in a state of anxiety, we are no longer in charge of our full, um, our full logical brain. We have now, we're now more in a survival mode brain. Mm -hmm. the, the body- for some, for some people, they, they're always in that state. 
always. Um, they're, they're, that state is always engaged. And I, and I do a little bit want to go back to the relationships. Um, I think some people feel constant anxiety in certain relationships. Well, that's, I mean, this, this is work that I would suggest they do mm -hmm. with a behavioral therapist or with a neuro-linguistic programming practitioner or a timeline therapy practitioner. Um, cause there's, there's a few things. Um, one, it might not be a healthy relationship. I mean, cause we're talking about a very general topic here, which is like yes. having anxiety in a relationship. It, you may have warranted, warranted anxiety. They may not be an emotionally healthy person for you. They may be emotionally abusive and, and you may not be enforcing your boundaries in a healthy way. And so your boundaries are being violated. Mm -hmm. And that, you I'm know, so that, that you're bringing up this point, Ashley, because this is another positive aspect of anxiety that it's actually telling you something that yes. something could be wrong. Yes. Yes. That's, that, that is absolutely mm -hmm. what I'm saying. It is the dashboard. It's the, the red light. If you have a car, there's red lights that pop up. They're like, warning, check engine light. Anxiety mm -hmm. is our check engine light. Um, mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that people are doing bad things out here. It means we are imagining a stressor, either a fake one, like a, like imagining something negative happening in the future. Like you're imagining that you'd get tired in the future. It hasn't happened yet. I'm not saying we're psychic. Like pretend like we're not psychic. Okay. It hasn't happened yet. So you're making it up. It's totally made up. You're, mm -hmm. you're making up in your head. A, a potential threat and then you're having an anxiety response in the now of something made up right so so that's that's uh, an internal in totally an internal thing mm -hmm. but anxiety can also happen because there are external threats happening right now like people in, uh, in, um, in violating our boundaries and us no, not knowing how to handle it but we always have to come to what what, what am I focusing on? Am I, so my, so let's say our partner is saying something or doing something. Mm -hmm. We have to ask ourselves, what am I focusing on? So they said that or did that, what am I focusing on? Am I focusing on that that means, so in my example, my, my boyfriend's taking his ring off, that means he's going to break up with me. Mm -hmm. And it happened in a split second, but that's how quickly our mind works. What are we focusing on? Now, if you find yourself in constant anxiety in a relationship, absolutely do therapy. Therapy with a good therapist is to help us become optimal. We should always look to grow, per, do personal growth for optimal growth and growth and opt, be able to be in um, the healthiest relationships possible and be able to communicate in the healthiest way possible, be able to enforce healthy boundaries. So finding the type of therapy that, that teaches you life skills, like NLP does. Um, there's also um, nonviolent communication, which is a wonderful tool for learning how to enforce healthy boundaries. Mm -hmm. I don't like to say, because I like to teach people to be at cause in their world. I don't like to say, oh, it's always his fault or oh, it's always her fault. It's always the partner's fault. But there is a percentage of people for whom they will realize they're in a unhealthy relationship. And that's where the anxiety was coming from. Yes, and a lot and of people I'm so glad that you, you yeah. talked about that because it, for people that have anxiety, it can be challenging to even have that distinction yeah. because oftentimes what happens is they can self project and they can say, now I need to amp it up, um, you know, to, to accommodate my partner even more because something's wrong with me. I mean, there, there is a mm. challenge as well and, because you don't know, you don't yeah. know how to deal with the anxious feelings. So, you know, to say, is it healthy and, or is it not healthy? And, and to really look at that and take time to center yourself yeah. and, and to look at it more closely rather than, you know, just stay in an anxiety written situation. So right. the choices are to receive therapy, um, to look at if this relationship is actually healthy. Yeah. Do you feel loved and respected and heard? Mm -hmm. you know, and do, do journaling, figure out what, what's going on and see, are your thoughts focusing on what you don't want to have happen? Mm -hmm. Or are you, are you, you know, is it that they're saying things that then have you, I mean, it would have to be pretty obvious for them to be like, if you do this, I'm going to do this like threats. Right. And then you feel anxiety because then you're like threat. imagining them actually fulfilling their threat. 
Right. You know, that's, there's some unhealthy communication going on if there's threats, right? So what, what's happening that's triggering your anxiety? Like really slow it down, but ask yourself, what am I focusing on? Because if you, if you really pinpoint what your focus is on, you'll, you will know exactly when your anxiety gets triggered, you will be like, oh, that is what I'm focusing on. My example, um, um, I'm from Canada and I, every year would slip on the ice around February in Toronto. We always have ice rain and I'd always slip and fall and bruise my tailbone really bad, like very painful. And when I learned this technique, when I learned this um, idea of focusing on what you want, I couldn't believe it. There I was, it was February. I was halfway from my house to the car when I might, I could feel my feet starting to slip and I stopped and I, I actually heard my thoughts for the first time. Sometimes our self-talk is so quick and it's just so part of us that we don't become the observer, that third, that fly on the wall, observing our own self-talk. Mm-hmm. But I heard my thoughts go, I don't want to slip. I don't want to slip. And then I realized that I am focusing on what I don't want to do. And in doing so, I'm imagining myself slipping. and I'm sending a signal to my body that I, to slip. I'm telling my body to slip by saying, I don't want to slip. I should back up and explain that the mind cannot hear, they cannot focus on a negative directly. So if I say to you, don't think of a red sweater, <laughs> don't think of a silver Mercedes, don't think of a, um, a beautiful Hawaiian beach, right? Don't think of an ocean cruise. Like we're, you're thinking of all those things right? That's what our mind does. So what happens is when we imagine, when we say to ourselves, I don't want to X, I don't want to be poor. In your case, I don't want to be tired. You imagine yourself tired or you imagine like whatever it is. And I imagined myself falling. And in that moment gave myself anxiety. And in that moment told my body to fall. I caught myself and I was, I was shocked. And then I said, okay, well, if I'm focusing on what I don't want to have happen, and this is an ingrained, it's, I've been my entire life, this is how my thought process have gone. So it's going to take a while to rewire myself, but, but how can I now focus on what I want? What's the, if I, I don't want to fall, but what is the opposite of not wanting to fall? And I had to stand there in the freezing ice rain until I got it. Okay. I want to walk safely erect to my car and I imagine that bear claws were coming out of my shoes or out of my boots and um, gripping the ice and I walked safely I kept saying I want to walk erect and safely to my car and I'm imagining now doing that and I didn't slip and every year after that I did not slip on the ice because I had to rewire my thinking so when we slow ourselves down we will hear our thought process, hear the, that con- the unconscious programming that we're so used to focusing on what we don't want to have happen. I don't want my partner to do this. I don't want my kids to do that. You know, we can't, we're constantly thinking about what we don't want to have happen. Mm-hmm. But by doing so, we're imagining, we're imagining threats. These are threats that turn on the stress response that trigger anxiety because the anxiety is the dashboard light going, are you focusing on what you want? Thank you so much, Ashley James. That's very interesting. We are coming up on time. I wanted to ask you if there is one or two last tips that you'd like to share with the listeners on what they can do when they feel the onset of anxiety or panic attacks. Absolutely. So do this technique, the technique I taught. Mm-hmm. Um, there are, there's a percentage of times where anxiety is a nutrient, nutrient deficiency, magnesium being a big one. Um, I really believe in soaking in magnesium from the Zextine C. And I have a whole, ep- I have like five episodes on that actually on my, the Learn Trail podcast. Um, sometimes anxiety is caused by a blood sugar imbalance. So whether you have metabolic syndrome, type two diabetes, type one diabetes, or you may not have undiagnosed prediabetes, that actually was one of my problems as well with my generalized constant anxiety as a child is I had, um, I was borderline diabetic and then I became full-blown diabetic. 
Um, I have since healed that. I'm no longer diabetic. I've healed five diseases using food and nutrition um, and lifestyle changes. And that's why I'm so, 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 so passionate about holistic health. That's what my podcast is about. It's about holistic health mentally and emotionally and spiritually and physically. Um, my other advice would be listen to my show because I have, I'm coming up on 400 episodes and they're really long interviews. They're like two hour long interviews with holistic health experts. And I make sure we get lots of great information out of each one so that you can get so much value um, and so many great tips for, for changing your life, for healing your gut and, and becoming emotionally, you know, even healthier. Um, I have yeah, Ashley's homework. podcast is Learn True Health. Yes. Thank you. And I have homework. Um, I actually have um, a free webinar that is an hour long webinar on anxiety. And I teach, I teach this, what I taught you today. And then I teach another exercise. That's something that you do every morning to help rewire the brain in the free webinar as well. And you can find that going to my website, learntruehealth.com. Learntruehealth.com. So is this the successful completion going after 15 minutes? Is that the go-to tool to use for anyone that's experiencing anxiety? Is that the one in, that you- Yes, have? when you're in anxiety in the moment, you, you, you have to figure out, first of all, what it is you have anxiety around. Some people don't know. And that, that takes then the self-exploration of going, well, what was I, what am I focusing on right now? What threat is my body perceiving that's either imagined or real? And, and am I focusing on what I don't want to have happen? And mm -hmm. can I change my thoughts to focus on what I do want to have happen? And then doing the exercise, if you know of an event for which you have anxiety around, going 15 minutes past this, the successful completion and seeing it, and then ask yourself, if you still have anxiety, ask yourself, okay, now what, now what am I anxious of? Mm -hmm. And go and go 15 minutes past the, the successful completion of that. Um, doing slow, deep breathing where you take five, four to, sorry, four seconds to do a full breath mm -hmm. and five seconds to do an exhale. You always want the exhale to be a little longer, always through your nose, both in and out. That you do about five minutes of that breathing and that will um, increase heart rate variability, which is a, the best way to measure the stress response and showing that you're lowering stress in your body. There, the studies are showing now that heart rate variability and, and the, you want the, the more heart rate variability, meaning the bigger variable between um, the heart rate during in-breath and out-breath, mm -hmm. um, they're now seeing that that measurement is the most um, accurate measurement of longevity and health. And they can predict whether people will die of a cardiovascular event soon or whether they will live into their 90s, depending on how much heart rate variability you create. So basically stress mm -hmm. is a huge component of overall health. And so doing deep breathing daily, I have a whole, I have a few interviews on that, um, on increasing heart rate variability through breath work. Doing that just gets you back in the body. But, but while you're doing that, focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. Thank you so much, Ashley James. This was really um, an interesting, fascinating talk. And I'm looking forward to people hearing about this successful completion technique. And if you want to learn more, feel free to go to Ashley's website, ashleyjames.com. Oh, no, it's learntruehealth.com. Yeah. Ashley James, I think .com is probably like some UK model or something. So if you look oh, up okay. my name, <laughs> you find a lot of like these really sexy pictures. And I'd love to say they're all of me, but it's some model in the UK. And then, um, and then there's a bunch of stuff about me. So I'm sure she's like, there's some health coach or something that teaches anxiety. <laughs> some, some model in the UK is like, that's not me. But yeah, yeah and I'm on Instagram. I'm on website. Instagram. <laughs> right. We should. Yeah, we should. Yeah. Um, I'm in, on Instagram at learntruehealth.com, Facebook, learntruehealth. Doc, or, sorry, learntruehealth, uh, at learntruehealth for, for everything, for Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. All your social handles. All, all the social handles, just learntruehealth. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you so much, Ashley James. It's been a pleasure.